Okay, here we go again. And now it's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. Is this the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine or is this something else? Darn tootin' it is. Okay, so... <laughs> And this is going to be a special episode, a live episode. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. Did I say that or did I not? I did, didn't you I? You said it in Okay, I won't voice. say it again. Sorry. Uh, we've got three special episodes coming up here. This is the first of those three. These are the live story readings that we did at the New Media Expo in January. And yeah, uh, we had several people involved in our readings of each of these stories. I think today's cast includes Abby Hilton, Renee Chambliss, Chris Lester, who I don't I don't believe we've had Chris Lester do a voice on any of our stories before, have we? I don't believe so, no. But Chris Lester from Metamore City does one of the voices on this story. It's Catastrophe Baker, so I get to do a voice as well. And uh, yeah, we have several other folks uh, in the other episodes that each helped us on these stories. It was something that we really wanted to do at the end of last year. We talked with uh, one of the guys that was in charge of putting together the podcasting thing in the New Media Expo, and we, we thought it would be a great way to showcase what we do is by actually doing live readings for people. And we showcased it for a few it, I think we had a larger audience at each one of these readings than we did at anything that we did last year. We, we, we haven't managed to uh, bring out the crowds just yet. But there's still time. Yeah, I wonder if we went to another convention, something that is much more podcaster friendly or much more fiction. Fiction podcaster friendly. friendly. If a bunch of people would be like, ooh, a, a, you know, a story reading. It seems like we're always hearing recordings of live readings at the Balticon or the Dragon Con or the Decepticon, you know, these things that happen. I would wonder, yeah, if maybe we should look into going to some other con for this kind of thing or well, if we would even be welcome there <laughs> they chase us out with pitchforks and torches well we can always look into that for now we have these and yeah these are the actual recordings from the show um we'll start with this catastrophe baker and the ship who purred by mike resnick if you've listened to our show for a while you ha- are familiar with the catastrophe baker stories but I'm not going to say much more because we actually have the story introduced by one Rish Outfield live at the con. So we'll just go ahead and go to that and he can uh, lead us into the story. Take it away. Recorded live Rish Outfield. Go. Okay. Hey, welcome. Thank you, lady and gentlemen, for coming to the panel today. At uh, this, this, I think it's the fifth annual Bridal Expo and the thing is, in a, a young girl's life, there's one day that she looks for. Oh, uh, <laughs> New Media Expo is uh, an exciting time in a young girl's life. <laughs> no, uh, my name is Rich Outfield. I am the host of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Mag- co host with Big Anklovich here of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And we are a podcast that puts together short stories, short fiction stories with a full cast, uh, along with music and sound effects. And uh, we're going to be presenting a story by Mike Resnick today. And Mike Resnick is the most Hugo-nominated writer alive, or ever, or uh, undead or alive. He's got 36 Hugo nominations, and he's known for writing these heartbreaking stories that just rend your pants. And he, uh... That part's actually true. But this is not one of them. He, and this is not. We did a story from him years ago, and I emailed him and told him, thank you, you know, and people cried, and we cried. And, and he said, you know, I really love comedy, and nobody ever wants a comedy story from me. And I said, oh, well, we'll take one. And he sent us an entire list of these Catastrophe Baker stories that he's written, which are tall tales set in space 
of an adventuring, loving <clears throat> ed- hero. Yes, and they're always catastrophe baker and the, and then it's the name of a popular science fiction story. Catastrophe baker and the cold equations. Catastrophe baker and the canticle for Le- Leibowitz and. Uh, the one we're presenting today is Catastrophe Baker and the Ship That Purred. And I think it's self-explanatory, uh, but this, this panel is made up of, uh, well, Chris Lester from the Metamore podcast, Metamore City podcast, and uh, Big Anklevich <clears throat> from the Doonstief, Abigail Hilton from the Guild of the Cowry Catchers, and uh, Renee Chambliss from... <clears throat> Wretchbliss.com and uh, Dreaming of Deliverance. I will step down, but but first, uh, Renee won a Parsec Award for our podcast this year for uh, Best Short Story. And anyway, we actually brought that today to give to her <laughs> the, the, the trophy that she won for producing for us. And she is... The reason we're here today, she put all this together, the panels that you're about to see in this room, unless you leave. And uh, so I'd like to thank her and give her this. And the story is, uh, it's PG-13. There's a little bit of amorous adventure in there. And uh, so thank you. I will sit. Thank you, Rish. We'll get started with the story. So Catastrophe Baker, take it away. All right. Catastrophe Baker and the Ship Who Purred by Mike Resnick. It wasn't much of a war, just us humans against no more than 30 or 40 little alien worlds that were feeling their oats. And after it had gone on for a few months and reached the spot in the inner frontier where I was hanging out at that time, I decided to do something about it before one side or the other blew up my favorite watering holes. So I hopped into my ship and soon touched down on Henry III, the third planet in the Plantagenet system, which was supposed to be one of the alien strongholds. I hunted up the enemy encampment, which wasn't all that hard to find, walked into the middle of it and stood there with my hands on my hips. My name's Baker. I hollered, Catastrophe Baker, and I'm here to settle this war by fighting your champion, winner take all. Suddenly, I was instantly surrounded by armed aliens. A couple of hundred weapons were aimed at me, and finally one alien, who was wearing more medals than any of the others, stepped forward. Your reputation precedes you, Catastrophe Baker, but how do we know that you are truly that hero? If I ain't, Your champion will beat me without working up a sweat. True enough. But we are already winning the war, so your offer is meaningless. You ain't won nothing. I'm still standing, I told him. Blow his legs off, said a feminine voice. I turned and found myself facing a beautiful young woman. Now that's a hell of a thing for a prisoner to suggest, ma'am, I said, meaning no offense. I'm not a prisoner. Well, if push comes to shove, it's even a worse thing for a turncoat to suggest. I'm just a businesswoman. These people need weapons, I sell weapons. We feel mutual needs. What are you doing here all by yourself? It goes with the hero in trade, ma'am. I aim to take on their most fearsome fighter, wipe up the floor with them, and bring this unfortunate conflict to a close. She stared at me for a long moment. You really believe that, don't you? Ain't nothing born, fold, hatched, or spawned has ever been able to make me holler uncle. I don't imagine these here alien scum got the exception. Why should they fight you at all? They've already defeated the Navy, and you're here all by yourself. Why shouldn't they just kill you and be done with it? Are you sure you're a woman and not just some alien look-alike? I'm a woman. You sure don't sound like a member of the same race. You got a name, ma'am? I've got lots of names. In my profession, it's a necessity. You got one you prefer to all the others? Not really. 
Well, then, since we're on Henry the Third, I think I'll call you Eleanor of Providence. Isn't that the name of the moon? Your every bit as round in the right places as the moon. Flattery will get you nowhere. I ain't flattering you, ma'am. You can't help being beautiful any more than you can help being deceitful, backstabbing, unscrupulous traitor to the human race. But at least you're easy on the eyes. You still haven't answered the lady's question, Catastrophe Baker. Why shouldn't we just shoot you down in cold blood? Because you don't want me to fall down. Why not? I opened my tunic to show him all the explosives I had taped to my torso. Because if I fall down, so will every alien and every structure within ten miles of me. Then why should we have our champion face you? If he knocks you down, the effect will be the same as if we were to shoot you right now. You give me your word of honor as an alien and an officer that you won't shoot me, and I'll take the bombs off before the fight. And if we refuse, what then? I ain't thought that far ahead. A, a race that's willing to take on the race of man don't strike me as a bunch of lily-livered cowards. You have a remarkable way of expressing yourself. Even when you're complimenting us, it sounds like an insult. Have your champion make me apologize, I suggested, seeing a way to get the show on the road. You are much bigger than any of us. I don't think it would be a fair fight. I'm not much more than six foot nine or ten. I only weigh about 275. I tell you what, I ain't twice as big as you, but I'll take on your two best at the same time. That ought to make it a fair fight. Hmm, it's an interesting proposition, but the stakes are unrealistic. I do not have the authority to call off the war, and when your navy sends reinforcements, as I suspect it will, I very much doubt that you can get them to return to their base. Okay, you got a point. What stakes do you want to fight for? <laughs> we don't need money, we don't need weapons. I have no idea what else you want, so why don't you propose the stakes? Okay. I reckon I'd better, if we're gonna get this thing up and running. I looked around the area, and then my eyes came back to Eleanor Province. Here's my proposition. If I win, you give me the woman. What? Us humans gotta stick together. The closer, the better. That's outrageous. Fighting for outrageous stakes just naturally goes with being a hero, ma'am. Just a minute. That's what we give you if you win. What do you give us if we win? I'll fight the rest of the war on your side. I ain't got no use for your alien scum, meaning no offense. So it'll just give me that much more incentive to win. Hmm. But if you do lose, you will place yourself under my command. Right. I suppose it won't be all that terrible. I like fighting. <laughs> It's a deal. Now, wait a minute. I don't expect to lose this wager. But even if I do, how can I turn down the proposition? If our champions lose, then while I will miss your wit and charm and companionship, you are, after all, merely a salesperson of dubious loyalty who can be easily replaced. But if we win, we will secure the services of the famous Catastrophe Baker. How long will it take you to prepare? As long as it takes me to unwrap these here bombs, we shall be ready. They kept an eye on me while I took off all the explosives and laid them gently on the ground. When I was done, I looked around to see if my opponents had shown up yet. They had. One was short and heavily muscled, the other tall and lean with the grace of a dancer. What are the ground rules? asked the alien commander as the two champions approached me. What rules? I said. This here's a freehand fight. Hitting, kicking, biting, and gouging are all legal. So are kidney punches, always assuming you've got kidneys. When is it over? Uh, when only one of us is left standing. I agree to your rules, or lack of them, said the commander. His army moved closer, forming a circle about 30 feet in diameter around three combatants. Let the battle begin. The muscular alien charged me right away. I could have sidestepped, grabbed an arm, and twisted, but I wanted to see how he measured up to Hurricane Smith and Gravedigger Gaines, some of the heroes I'd tussled with over the years. So I just planted my feet and took the charge against my chest and belly. Poor little bastard bounced right off. Now the tall one approached cautiously, dancing on his toes like a boxer. 
Suddenly, he launched a kick at my groin. I grabbed his foot before it landed, lifted as high as I could, and gave it a quick twist. The alien flipped in the air and landed on his back with a heavy thud. Come on, I said to them. Stop taking it so easy and let me have your best shot. Both aliens charged me at once. I took a couple of blows to the face and one to the neck, then swung a roundhouse at the taller, thinner alien and floored him. I could taste a little trickle of blood on my lip, so I licked it off and turned to the muscular alien. You throw a pretty nice punch for a little feller, I said. Now let's see how you take one. I kind of stalked him around the circle, finally came up with him, and gave him a medium hard slap on the side of his head. He dropped like a ton of bricks. Just as I was thinking the fight was already over, the taller alien leaped onto my back, biting my neck and digging his fingers into my eyes, which kind of got my temper up. I, I shook my head, which sent him flying through the air. I picked him up where he'd fallen, held him over my head, spun him around three or four times, and hurled him as far as I could. He flew totally beyond the circle as soldiers hit the ground with a loud thud, tried to get up, fell over, and just lay there. When I figured no one was going to get back up, I turned to the alien commander and said, they put up a good fight for a pair of alien heathen. Tell them when they wake up that they lasted about as long with me as anyone ever has. I walked up to the woman, took her by the hand. Come on, Queen Eleanor, time for us to be going. As we began walking to his ship, the alien commander called out after me. You have forgotten your explosives, Catastrophe Baker. We are an honorable race. We will allow you to take them with you. You keep them. You are sure? Yeah, they got waterlogged back on Silverleaf 7 a couple years ago. They haven't been worth a damn ever since. You couldn't blow them up with a detonator. I could tell Queen Eleanor was none too happy about having to be one in a fight, even though it was just what old time heroes in armor used to do all the time. I escorted her to my ship, and just to make sure she didn't run away, I stayed on the ground while she opened the hatch and entered the airlock. And then, before I could stop her, Eleanor locked the hatch and took off. She would be standing on the ground looking foolish as all get out. <laughs> Aliens laughed their heads off. And for a minute there, I was thinking of challenging a whole batch of them to a freehand fight to the death. But then I decided that it wasn't really their fault that I found a lemon in the Garden of Love. So I had them show me to her ship which I figured was mine now. It was the strangest looking damn spaceship I ever laid eyes on, but I couldn't see no reason not to appropriate it just the same, so I bade all the giggling aliens goodbye after signing 20 or 30 autographs and climbed into the ship. The control panel was like nothing I'd ever seen before. All the readouts were in some alien language, and the chairs and bulkheads felt kinda soft and almost lifelike. I didn't pay much attention to them, though. My main concern was trying to figure out how to activate the ship and take off. One button on the control panel caught my eye. It was a little brighter and a little shinier than the others, and since I couldn't just stare at the panel all day and do nothing, I reached out and pushed it, and heard a very high-pitched human squeal. <laughs> Who's there? I said, drawing my burner and spinning around. Me said a feminine voice. Where are you hiding? I'm not hiding at all. I'm the ship. Are you a cyborg or an artificial intelligence? Neither. I'm running out of guesses. I'm a living, genetically engineered being. You sound female. I am. Do any of these make us take off? I asked, hitting another couple of buttons on the panel. Oh, my God. Did I hurt you, ma'am? Do it again. So I pressed the buttons again and the ship just started purring like a cat. You you got a name, ma'am? Leonora. Well, Leonora, ma'am, can you maybe tell me how to get the hell off Henry the Third before these here aliens decide to bust the truce I kind of threw on them when we weren't looking? Just sit down. I'll take care of it. So I sat down, and before I could strap myself into the chair, its arms grabbed me, 
and kind of wrap themselves around me. And then I looked at the view screen and saw we were already above the stratosphere. The arms released me and kind of stroked me here and there before they went back into place. And then I got to my feet again and continued looking around. What's your name? Baker, I said. Catastrophe Baker. What a romantic name. You really think so? I always thought Hurricane Smith and Sundance Moondog grabbed up the really good names. I walked to the back of the cabin. Where's the galley? I ain't eaten since before I landed on Henry III. A wall slid away. Just enter this corridor, and it's the first room on the left. So I took a step into the corridor, and the ship shuddered a little, like it was going through a minor ion storm. I, I stuck my arms out against the walls to make sure I didn't fall down. Oh. 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 I'm sorry if I'm discommoded you, ma'am. I, I don't mean you no harm. You're not doing me any harm. I could have sworn she was panting. Well, I kept walking down the corridor and she kept saying, Oh. With each step I took. And then I came to the room on the left and I entered it. And sure enough, it was the galley, though... It wasn't like any galley I'd ever seen before. There was a table and a chair right in the middle, and all kinds of incomprehensible controls and gauges along the wall. What would you like, Catastrophe Baker? Maybe a sandwich and a beer if it's no trouble, ma'am. No trouble at all. Do you see the glowing pink button on the wall, just to the left of the holographic readout? Yeah. Just press it. Don't I have to tell it what I want? Just press it. So I walked over and I pressed it. Wow. Purred Leonora. W what do I do now, ma'am? Now you eat. What I mean is, where's my food? On the table. And sure enough, it was. I sat down and started chewing on the sandwich. You're so much more considerate than my last owner. I ain't your owner, ma'am. I'm more like your borrower. We would make such a wonderful team. Won't you consider it? Well, sure, if you want me to keep you. Oh, yes. Well, as long as we're man and ship, how about heading over to Barleycorn, too? Done. As simple as that? Well, you could get us there faster by adjusting the navigational control. Uh, how do I do that? A wall panel slid into the floor revealing a whole new bunch of flashing lights and buttons and controls and such. Do you see that little wheel on the Q-valve? Yeah. Turn it to the left. Whatever you say, ma'am. I walked over to it and gave it a quick spin. Oh my, oh my, oh my. <laughs> did, I, did I hurt you, ma'am? No. Is that it or is there anything else I should do? Well, <laughs> I never knew you had to fiddle with so many controls to adjust the navigational computer, but finally I must have heard her because she told me she couldn't take anymore. And I said that I was okay. If we got there an hour or two later, it would be no problem. The trip took two days, and she was just the sweetest thing you'd ever want to meet or travel with. She insisted that I eat three meals a day, and we kept working on that navigational system whenever I had a chance. And then finally we touched down on Barleycorn and suddenly I noticed a note of concern in Leonora's voice. Where are you going? Oh, I'm off to visit an old friend. Will I ever see you again? Sure you will. I don't plan to spend the rest of my life on Barleycorn too. Actually, I just plan to spend one night there renewing an old acquaintance ship with the evening star, a lady embezzler who doubled as an exotic dancer. I took her out to dinner, and during the course of the meal I mentioned Leonora, and nothing would do but that I took her there later in the evening so she could see the living ship for herself. She is certainly cute, she said as we stood in front of Leonora. So are you, I said, kind of gently nuzzling her neck and ear and starting to subtly remove her tunic. And you got racier lines. <laughs> my, you're impetuous. She said, giggling and slapping my hand. 
but not so hard that I took it away. Could be, I replied, since I had never seen my birth certificate, but my friends call me catastrophe. Well, we started renewing our friendship in earnest right there in the shadow of the ship. We kind of did a little of this and a little of that, and by the time I took her back home, she decided that no woman in her right mind would ever call me catastrophe again. It was when I came back to the ship that the trouble started. I've never been so insulted in all my life. What are you talking about? The second I turn my back, you seduce that ugly little tart. She ain't ugly. And besides, I'd done it in front of your back, I said, figuring I had to speak up for the evening star, since she wasn't there to speak up for her own self. And you're filthy. Get out of these clothes immediately and take a bath. You're sounding a lot more like a mother than a spaceship, I complained. Did I upset you? Yeah, a little. Good. Then we're even. Well, from that moment on, things went just from bad to worse. Every time I gave her a new location to visit, she gave me the old third degree about what woman I was planning to ravish. She wouldn't send or accept any subspace radio message that had a female at the other end. If I talked in my sleep and mentioned a lady's name, she'd wake me up and demand to know who I'd been talking about. Finally, after three or four more days, she announced that she was taking me back to the Plantagenet system. What's going on? I can't stand it anymore. I can't concentrate on navigation. I can't compute my fuel consumption. I can't focus on meteor swarms and ion storms. You got some kind of a headache? I have a case of unrequited love and it's driving me crazy. You are my every thought, and yet I mean nothing to you. Sure you do. As a woman? As a spaceship? <laughs> she screamed in agony. I'm sorry, I truly am. I wish I wasn't so goddamn attractive and irresistible to women, but it ain't something I can control. It just seems to go with being a practitioner of the hero trade. She didn't say another word until we entered the atmosphere of Henry II. Then she asked me in a very small voice, Would you adjust my gyros just once for old time's sake? Sure. Where are they? A couple of knobs started flashing. Well, I'll be damned. I thought you used them to home in on different radio frequencies. I reached out and started turning the knobs. Hmm. I spun the left hand one. Oh. I twisted the right hand one. Oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> she screamed. Then, was it good for you too? We landed a couple of minutes later and she let me out and took off for parts unknown. And that's the true story of the ship who purred. Author's note. Catastrophe Baker was created in a novel of mine called The Outpost, from which this and half a dozen other Baker stories was excerpted. He proved so popular that I've since, at editorial request, written and sold some new Catastrophe Baker adventures. Each of them has a little fun with some science fiction classic. This one owes a debt of gratitude to my friend Anne McCaffrey's The Ship Who Sang. Others have fun with Tom Goodwin's The Cold Equations, Walter Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz, Murray Leinster's First Contact, and so on down the line. They've been a lot of fun, and I would think that about five years from now I'll have enough for a Catastrophe Baker collection. All right, I hope you enjoyed our live reading of Catastrophe Baker and the Ship Who Purred. I hope they enjoyed it. Is this the fourth one of these we've done? Fourth yeah. story of, of Mike Resnick. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I guess it's our fifth Mike Resnick story, but I mean, you know. Our maybe. fourth Catastrophe Baker story, yes. The only thing I want to say about it, well, there's two things I want to say. One is, for some reason, the sound isn't as good in this one as it should be. But sometimes you'll hear these live readings 
on other podcasts. Uh, wait, let me rephrase. Sometimes I hear these live readings on other podcasts. And it, yeah, you can't understand a dang word they're saying. <laughs> yeah, there is definitely a varying quality to uh, live reading recordings. All the stuff that we recorded at the New Media Expo, right after this particular session is when I figured out how I could plug my Zoom portable recorder into their mixer and record it straight into my Zoom and not have to deal with uh, going and downloading it from their site later. Unfortunately, I figured it out right after this one. So everything else I recorded was recorded straight out of their mixer. This one I had to download the MP3 off of their website after they finally got around to getting it uploaded uh, at the end of January. So you get what you get when you don't get in there and record it yourself. It wasn't terrible in this one. It was definitely usable and, and it sounded good. There was just a little bit of echo going on in the room, which I don't think there's as much of in the other recordings, which seems weird to me because I was taking it out of their mixer. So you would think that they took their sound out of their mixer as well, but I don't know what the difference was. I really enjoyed the reading. I, I enjoyed doing it. Catastrophe Baker is one of those characters that I think I can, I've got a good handle on and I can do really well. Was this the first time that you have had a live reading? It was, yeah. This, as long as we don't count like office visit that we did at the uh, at the last New Media Expo, but that wasn't done in front of an audience. It was done in front of just all the podcasters sitting around in the hotel room. So I wouldn't count that. That was the first time I've ever read something live for an audience. I hope it's not the last time. I really enjoy, well, I, obviously it wasn't the last time, I guess, because we did two more of them. But I hope the, the New Media Expo wasn't the last time because I, I liked it. And if I'm just doing more live readings, maybe that means that I'm like a, a real author going around to bookstores and having people show up to hear me read. That would be cool, right? Oh, I think that that would be awesome. Yeah. I haven't really experienced that many of them where an actual author comes and reads an excerpt from his book. But I always find it riveting when they do. I don't know why. I just I like storytellers and I like to be told a story. And this feels like that when somebody just opens a book and reads. Um, the other thing I was going to say, and I don't know if it matters. Oh, I, I guess I was going to ask you if it was more difficult than when we were just doing it. Was there any pressure knowing that the audience was there? And there was quite a, pr a crowd on this first day. There was uh, a little bit more pressure. Luckily, like I said, it was Catastrophe Baker, which I have a really good handle on. I didn't have to sit there and think, okay, how should I play this? How should I do this guy or anything like that? Because I've done him already for three other stories and I've got a pretty good feel. But I did make sure to read it over a few times beforehand just so that I didn't come across some of those. Because Catastrophe Baker says things like flang him against the wall instead of flung or flinged or whatever. <laughs> it makes me forget what, even, what the proper pronunciation is. Yeah, he says stuff like that, and if you're not prepared for it, you're going to say it wrong and sound stupid. It wasn't that bad. I, I I had a good time with it. And, you know, if you messed up, you messed up, and you just reset it. It wasn't a big deal, which is the way we usually do things. We sit here in my study, and we mess up, and, oh, we go back and we fix it. Although in this particular case, you don't go back as much. You just say the word right instead of going back and re-saying the sentence because you have to have it perfect for the recording. So it may, in a way, I guess there's less pressure <laughs> as far as that goes. Well, that's cool. That, that, that's good. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention was Renee's choice of delivery for the, uh, the ship. And uh, she told me beforehand what she was going to do. And I, I have to admit, the first thing I thought is, why? Why would you? Why? I don't understand because, you know, I knew what the context, I knew what was going on with right. the ship. And I just thought, why would you do it in some emotionless way? And the, yeah, her I remember. choice was such an inspired one because it was hilarious. And yeah, I remember much thinking funnier, that same I thought, than it would have been had you just done it the way I would have done it. Right. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. It's like how I, that, it didn't seem like that could work. But it worked, and it worked amazingly. Yeah, it was so much funnier, I think, than it would have been had she been screaming in uh, ecstasy or whatever. And 
You know, this isn't the first time that Catastrophe Baker has inspired such feelings in lady folk. And the other time around, I think Renee was the producer of the story, if I remember right, and she chose to do it a different way too, you know, with the the opera singing stuff where she was hitting the notes and they were super high pitched, you know, it was, it was a similar thing. And I remember hearing that because I heard the raw recording of that. It, it came into my Dropbox and I think I then moved it along to Renee's Dropbox and I played it and I was just like, what? Oh no. And yeah, that again in in that story was another one of those inspired and wonderful moments. So it's good that we got Renee around because, you know, if it weren't for her, we still wouldn't have a parsec. Cool. Uh, we said we weren't going to say a great deal in these episodes, but, you know, now that we're here, why not? You know, I guess we've talked. If, is there anything else you want to say about? Well, you do have to edit them all. So if we say a great deal, <laughs> then you have a great deal of work to do. That's the only reason I suggested we do that. I, I We said a little bit on the That Gets My Goat about this, but and I guess I did say it that day that you heard at the intro. A lot of this is thanks to Renee. She was the one that submitted our names uh, for the readings and what the names of our panels would be in the subjects and who was going to be on each one. And, and she did so much work at this New Media Expo thing that uh, the success, and I thought that it was a total success, all uh, is on her shoulders. Yeah, she really made it, it happen. It was interesting because each year it's been kind of that way. The first year that we went uh, was kind of because of Abby Hilton. She became connected with whoever was in charge of it. And they said, hey, why don't you come and speak here? And she rounded up all the people to to be in the panels. And we wound up with two panels. And, uh, you know, she helps come up with topics and so forth. And uh, then this year... Abby didn't want to do that because she'd done it once and had her fill. And yeah, Renee stepped in and took the reins and did a great job. And we had even more panels and even more podcasters present. It almost seemed like a lot of work. It was really hard this year because, yeah, instead of just doing one panel on the very last day of the thing, we were there and we did one panel every day and several panels most days. And, um, yeah, it was so much more exciting, so much more uh, of a success, I guess you could say. And, yeah, I mean, we we presented her with her parsa. I don't know if she was expecting to ever get that. Um, I wanted her to have it because it seemed like she deserved one. And you were able to, I found out that you were able to just order as many of them as you wanted. I could have got one for every person who did a voice for it, I suppose. Well, you'd have to pay for each one. Yeah. So. It weren't free. <laughs> but we felt that definitely Renee deserved one. And so we made sure that she got her parsec. And it would have been fun to present that to her on the last day instead. As sort of thanks for getting us a parsec and for all the amazing work that you did. Because, yeah, it really was a lot. And uh, I hope she understands just how much we appreciate what she did to make uh, everything go as well as it did. Because it was a success in all ways. Not just the convention itself, but being able to meet the people that we met there and all the recordings of all the different things that we were able to do there. It was all just, everything went really well. On top of that, we came away from there excited and wanting to improve and to do more. And, you know, had we not gone, we probably wouldn't have. No, I, I think that that's totally due to the New Media Expo. And, and also, though, just you and me going on a road trip together where we podcasted for hours and hours and hours. It was so fun. And it made the drive, which is 12 hours, just fly by. And that sort of thing just feeds into itself, where it's like, wow, this has been great. We should do this all the time. We should do more episodes. And meeting people who cared about the show, that the show meant something to them, was really inspiring, too. Yeah, yeah. We had Tom Tancredi, who did last week's episode, was there. He came out to the New Media Expo. Specifically, or uh, I mean, that one of the reasons why he came to the New Media Expo, anyways, was because he wanted to meet us, which was kind of flabbergasting and is that a word flabbergasting must be because like flabbergasted 
is the can tense. can you flabbergast someone? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> okay, I, I I want you to name three celebrities you would like to flabbergast. Okay, uh, Rachel McAdams and oh, I'm uh, sorry, we've run out of time. We just uh, oh, I just looked to see how much uh, and uh, yeah, we we've got to go. Oh, okay. No, but they were, did you want to say their name? <laughs> well, I was going to mention that uh, someone else came to uh, oh, okay. to see us at karaoke night. That was not Rachel McAdams, unfortunately. It was Rachel Doherty. I liked Rachel Doherty more than Rachel McAdams. Okay, well, I was not going to say anything about wanting to flabbergast <laughs> Rachel Doherty ah. because she's a married woman and I respect her too much to 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 say something like that but <laughs> see because flabbergast comes from the root word flab oh. yeah. so that can only really mean all right anyway <laughs> so yes she came to karaoke night yes. with us and uh boy karaoke night was fun even the karaoke this year was better than last year yeah there you go so uh it's got us almost, you know, considering perhaps going to a different con or more cons or Decepticons. Yeah, I did make a very lame joke, but I, I had to come up with something that ended in con and I couldn't think of any dirty words. Yeah, again, uh, we, you were just talking about it recently and I'm trying to remember in what it was. Oh, it was your, in, in your ankle cast. You were talking about how great it would be if the podcast made us enough money that you could just quit your job. And we'd edit podcasts all the time and we'd do all sorts of stuff like that. And, and the, you know, we could afford to go to Baltimore or to Maryland or to the greater D.C. area or, you know, all those <laughs> corners of America. And uh, we hear about the things that go on, you know, in Atlanta or, or, or Boston or, or Des Moines. The, and I, I things I, that go on in Atlanta stay in Atlanta. We don't you don't really hear about what goes on there. OK, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> Their accent vexes me. But yeah, boy, it would be cool to be able to go and do something like that. The pe people, the way they talk about these other uh, conventions, it's, it sounds like just a blast. It sounds like a party and, and people go home energized in the same way that we were from this. And plus they have hangovers and new friends and tattoos, you know, things that they didn't have before. Uh-huh. So yeah, it would be really cool to uh, to try that out. Maybe we can get ourselves into a situation where that's possible. Uh, well, how would we do that? What? Uh, okay. Well, the if people donated to the show, that would be good, because then we might be able to get ourselves to Baltimore. I mean, that's one of those things that we're trying to do. If we could make this a full time job, I mean, that would be amazing, and we could get so much done. We could write stories for the show, and 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 so on and so forth. Um. So we encourage you, if you enjoy the show, donate $1 a month. If you really enjoy the show, donate $2 a month. If you really, show. really enjoy the show. Let's just keep going with that. No, anyways, it would be cool because then we'd get out to the East Coast and we could see maybe a few more fans. We're, we're stuck on the West Side and uh, for one thing, everything is further apart on the west side of the country, so it's hard to uh, be able to see folks that are into the show. And yeah, lots of people go to these Dragon Con and, and Baltic Con, from what I understand. So we could meet a lot of folks that, you know, are friends of the show, and that would be really neat. Well, how is it that all the other podcasters seem to have money? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I, I wouldn't be able to work that out. Maybe they don't have kids that eat all their money on them like me i'm not sure okay well that actually inspires more questions than it does answer them but uh that's all right so uh, we'll be back soon with another um live reading from the new media expo that's right we'll be back very soon watch and wait <laughs> all right <laughs> on that inspired note Thank you for listening. See you later, folks. Good night. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files.
take two. All right. So if we have time for questions, if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming. And we had a lot of fun. We love reading these stories. It's fun to do them for an audience. Where are you guys all based at? Well, different. We're all from all over the place. And when we do these full cast stories, usually we record each part separately, and then a producer puts them all together. So. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I'm in up in Northern California, but I mean we work with sometimes people even in other countries. It's um, it's really great to be able to, to be able to do that. And if you want to hear some tips about how to make it sound like all the people are in the same room, you can come to the Advanced Audio Techniques panel, uh, which is tomorrow at I think three thirty or mm -hmm. yeah three thirty in this room. Um, in this room, uh, Brian Lincoln is a podcast producer who's done a lot of. Um, producing for a lot of different shows and he and I are going to be talking about the various tips and tricks you can use to make podcasts sound good when you've got lots of different audio coming together. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we enjoy so much being able to read these stories together because normally that's not how we do them. We're all kind of in our own little studios. It's fun to have that interaction. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, do you guys go off of, when you do the sound effects and stuff? Do you guys create your own, or do you go get them from like royalty free databases? Do a little of both. Sometimes I'll create them. Sometimes I'll go. There's like freesound.org, mm -hmm. and also uh, I have a whole mess of sound effects that came with Soundtrack Pro that I'll, I'll use as well. Uh, it just depends if I can find something. It's the specificity, like if you, yeah, you can't find certain things. If you can't find something, often Sound Dogs has it. Sound Dogs? Yeah. And they tend to, they run, they're paid, but they run like 3 to $10. So often I will look first uh, on the places that are free, like Free Sound and SoundSnap and various uh, sound libraries that have come with programs I've purchased. And I can't, if I can't find it there and it's really specific, I'll go to Sound Dogs. So there's, there are places you can buy them and, and then you can use them usually in pretty much anything you want to do, either free or paid. But yeah. For uh, for for the Metamore City, most of my sound effects come from the Digital Juice uh, sound libraries. They have uh, sound effect sound FX uh, volumes one through four. Um, I think each collection is around fifty dollars and contains thousands and thousands of sound effects. So, uh, I had another question. Have you guys ever done a live um, like where you sold tickets into a live kind of radio drama style performance where you play the sound effects? Like what you just did right now, except you sold tickets for it? Mm. Not selling tickets, but Chris has done the thing where you actually have the, you've actually got organized enough that you've got music playing and you can hit the sound effect at the right time and mm -hmm. have it come up while the person's speaking. Yeah, I do those. Was that the first time you did it? Um, very. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a big balancing act because, you know, as the, uh, when you're, you're producing a, podcast um, in your studio, you can take all the time in the world that you want to, but trying to get everything set up so that you have exactly the right sound at exactly the right time and things fade in and fade out when they're needed, um, it's much more of a dance. And uh, so it, it is helpful to have a person uh, there whose whole job is doing the sound effects, um, but uh, sometimes I have that and sometimes I don't. Yeah, it's gonna be rough. You wouldn't want somebody <laughs> like me stumbling over the lines and then suddenly your well orchestrated thing falls apart. Or as happened last year at Balticon, having somebody stumbling over the speaker cord and having it fall over. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some of that on Monday. <laughs> well, Brian's the man, so he's producing the story we're doing Monday, and there may be sound effects live. So. Technical aspects. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, as for doing, you know, a show with tickets and everything, I mean, I'm sure that that would be a lot of fun and we'd be open to that. It's just, since we are scattered about, that would be kind of tricky to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are theater companies and there are groups that do that kind of thing. That's so. true. Do you any of you produce your own content as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we all do. Well, what, what, what kind of schedule are you able to kind of stick to? Is it something there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I do my novels. Chris does novels and short stories. Okay. The Dunesteef guys do uh, 
some of their own stories and some of other people's stories, but it's all short stories released in a magazine format. Renee does voice acting for a lot of different... She's done voice acting for me. She's done voice acting for everybody here, I think. Yeah, and I've produced stories for the Doonstief. That's... I don't want to speak for them, but that's one of the ways that they do it is they... Yeah. They have their... They have producers... Um, take on different stories because it is especially with this full cast with all the different voices and the music and sound effect it's a huge effort it's very time consuming so for one person to try to regularly do that it would be a big <laughs> I, I, yeah. do, I do all my own production I just get the vo the vo people send me audio usually in Dropbox and then I pretty much do all the production from there and my estimate for people that are new to it is budget about uh, an hour for every finished minute of audio. So for a 70,000 word novel, that's about 420 hours. Um, now, if you've got some experience, it might be less than that. It might be more like 40 minutes per finished minute, or even 30 minutes per finished minute, but it's still um, a substantial time commitment. And I do novels in a series, so I try to finish one, and then I release it an episode every week, and then there's a, a long break when I like interview the different voice actors, sometimes just talk to my audience, occasionally release short stories that maybe someone else produced, and then after maybe six months, another novel will start going live in the feed. So that that's how I break it up. These guys, I don't know how they do it. These guys release a story. For a while, they were doing one every single week. Wow. And uh, now they do like two a month or something. But yeah. it's a huge amount of work. Uh, it just, I think it really depends on how much free time you have as to how <coughs> much you can get done. I used to have more free time. We had a baby recently, <coughs> and now I have no free time, really. <laughs> And so a lot of what I kind of was in charge of was kind of wrangling all of the various things. You know, I'd get in touch with the actors, the producers, etc., and, you know, make sure they know what their schedule is, get in touch with them when, you know, they're now behind their schedule or anything like that, and try and make sure that things came in on time. And, yeah, I've kind of fallen down on the job with that because I just can't keep up with it anymore so we were doing pretty you know two or we get like three or f sometimes even four episodes a month uh now it's, uh, we're still going but <laughs> it's more like one episode a month recently but uh they have a good suggestion for a social networking or, or a site that uh, <coughs> kind of encourages the fictional side of podcasting oh audiobooks.com that's where a lot of these are listed that's a clearinghouse and when i look at my downloads there's about 10 times as many off that site as there are from my own feed. Just because that's where people are coming to look for free audiobooks in podcast form. Now you can sell them now on ACX, that's kind of a new thing, and I do, and you can make money there. Potty Books is all free. But it's a great place for people to kind of get attached to your content, and then you can kind of ease them into selling stuff to them. But yeah, that's, that's the big site for, um, for books. Now for short stories, like, like these guys do, um, that's a little bit different. I don't know that there is a clearinghouse for podcast magazines. I yeah, think. it's more like just kind of a f community of folks, you know, you can... So you're saying create one of these yeah. <laughs> websites? Yeah. Uh, yeah by, by way of, like, Facebook and mm -hmm. Twitter and stuff like that, people will get, you know, they'll... Come check to out the various, mm -hmm. yeah, they'll check out the various shows that they like, and you'll hear, you know, this person who is normally on this other show is doing a voice on this story in this show and so you know hey maybe I should check out that show mm -hmm. and then you know so you it's more of the genre of the content as opposed to the genre of the yeah I think so Although there is a definite community of podcast fiction people um, it's it's kind of become its own little subculture um, and I think that a lot of a lot of the people who are in it are communicating with each other through things like Twitter and, um, you know, we share promos with each other so that we run on each other's podcasts, which helps to, um, you know, it's like, if you like my stuff, you know, listen to this other person's stuff. Um, some people have gotten to um, new audiences through um, feedback shows where they, they come on to somebody else's um, podcast and help them like answer emails and listen to you know talk about voicemails that they've received and um, in the process they can like s you know get people used to their voice get them to know a little bit about them and make them curious about that other author's stuff which can then lead to some cross promotion. Sir, 
Uh, it's what she's saying is that it's kind of like a a regular kind of a story magazine, like an analog or a Asimov's or something like that, where you have several stories. You get an issue, you have several stories. They're all by different people. Um, different authors. That means you're, you're having to vet a slush pile, which is work that I don't have to do. I'm podcasting novels and podcasting my own novels. Um, so you've got to have people reading the stories and deciding, curating your content. And then it's a different story each week. So they do have a few, a few stories that have kind of run in a series, but for the most part, the stories aren't related to each other. Right. Yeah, we have some authors that are favorites. Or we've done, like, for example, these catastrophe baker story. I think we've done three or four of them. Um, you know, sometimes we have stories like that that will come up again and again. But uh, for the most part, yeah, it's just whatever's good that comes into us is what we put out on our podcast. So we're like a podcast magazine. But if you're looking to get more information about podcast fiction and kind of bounce things off, I mean, it is a very welcoming, open group and community. And, you know, once you start listening to some of these podcast fiction, you know, magazines and novels, you'll get, you'll hear about other voice actors, you'll hear a, a voice that you like, and you'll look up their information. And so there isn't sort of kind of one clearinghouse to go to, but once you start getting involved with the community, um, you'll really get to learn so much and get to know everyone, and it's a great group. So. And that's the case, I'd love to do some network. Yeah, well, we're. You know, you can go, to, we're on the speaker's site, um, we're all there, so you can get to us that way, you can check out our websites here, um, but yeah, we're on Facebook, Twitter, all of that, like these guys all have forums on their own sites where their fans can communicate, and there's, you know, it's, uh, categories for other podcasts, you know, other things like that, so um, so it's definitely possible to get all the information you want. Brian and Abby, they produce a podcast called the Full Cast Podcast that's all about how to do full cast. Um, so that would be a great resource for you. There's a lot of fabulous information there. But, Thank you for Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> yeah. And we're going to be doing another one of these tomorrow at 1.30, I believe. So, right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.